One of the big challenges in putting together a handheld Raspberry Pi powered retro games console is getting a good quality, high frame rate display on a small LCD screen while still keeping the cost down. But even a sub £10 cheap generic LCD panel can give some great results. Let me show you how. Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. For a while now I've been considering building a portable retro games machine based around a, a Raspberry Pi Zero and an LCD screen. But I've been very keen to keep the cost down. So I've been having a look at these. Um, they're very cheap generic LCD panels. This is a 3.2 inch screen. Uh, and I picked this one up for under £10 on eBay. Now if we could actually get um, this screen working with the Raspberry Pi and then make that into the retro games console, well that would be a really cheap and a really good option. But the main problem facing us with a screen like this is it's driven over SPI, which is a serial bus. So your HDMI panels and so on, they just work straight off the card um, using that interface and running at 60 frames per second. But obviously we now have to get all of the pixel data out of our Raspberry Pi and send it across just a couple of wires into the screen and that, that causes a bit of a bottleneck. And, and quite often these sorts of screens run at around sort of 5 to 10 frames per second and, and that doesn't really give you smooth animation, that's more of a slideshow. So we need to figure out a way of getting our, our screen running at, say, between sort of 30 and 60 frames per second. And that turns it into a proper smooth animation when we play our games and makes them much, much more playable. So that's what we're going to look at in this video, is how we can get um, RetroPie, which is a, a, a um, games emulator, running on our Raspberry Pi, and then talking to our screen and making it a nice playable system. I'll quickly go through the process of installing RetroPie, setting up Wi-Fi and enabling SSH. Uh, we'll then load some games onto the SD card and then access the Raspberry Pi from our PC using this SSH connection. And that means we can unplug the monitor. So I've covered the installation of RetroPie in more detail in a previous video, so I'll put a link to that up in the top right corner. Um, so if you need more instructions, then please do go there. So to begin with then, we need to go to the retropie.org.uk website. Uh, click on the Downloads link, and then select the download that matches your particular Raspberry Pi. So I'm using the Raspberry Pi Zero for this project. Now once that's downloaded, um, we need to burn it onto an SD card. So I'm going to use a pro uh, application called Etcher to do that. Uh, and once that SD card is burnt, um, then we have a bootable um, SD card that we can use in the Raspberry Pi. So uh, make sure that you have a keyboard attached and that it's connected up to a monitor. Um, we can then power on the Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi will go through its initial boot up sequence and that, that includes resizing the hard disk image on the SD card so that it can use the full capacity of that card. Uh, and then it will reboot again. Um, but eventually you will get into Emulation Station and you'll see this start screen where it's asking you to plug in a game controller. Now we don't want to do that at the moment because we're going to go and set up SSH which will make it easy for us to access uh, this uh, Raspberry Pi. So just press F4 on your keyboard and that will then take you out of Emulation Station and into the Raspberry Pi console. So to set up the Raspberry Pi, we need to run a little application called Raspy Config. And this has a number of options we can set for the Raspberry Pi. So when we first run it, we need to set up our Wi-Fi. And the first thing to do on that is to set the localization options to tell it what country we're in. So I'm in Great Britain, so if I go to G, I can go for Great Britain. That takes us back to our main menu. So we go to System Options, Wireless LAN. 
we now need to enter our network um, SSID. And this is the broadcast name. So if you don't know what it is, um, if you have a phone or something connected to your wireless network, just pull up its wireless connection and you'll see the name of that particular connection. And that's what we need to type in here. So mine is that. You then of course need your network password. And enter for that. Back into here, we now need to, so that's, that's Wi-Fi setup. We now need to set up SSH so we can actually con connect to the Raspberry Pi remotely from our desktop computer. So that's an interface options and SSH. And it says here, would we like to enable that? And yes, we would. Uh, for, uh, so just click enter for that. So if you need to change the options, the left and right arrow keys will change those. So yes for that. And that's okay. And that's our Raspberry Pi now set up. So if I use the tab key, I can tab between these sections and I can finish. And that will then reboot my Raspberry Pi. So while that's booting up, I need to unplug my keyboard and plug in my game controller. And then I can go through the process of setting that up. All that's left then is to take out the SD card put it into my PC and copy some games across into the correct ROM folders. And we should then have a fully working RetroPie system with a few consoles. Setting up Wi-Fi and enabling SSH is going to allow us to run our Raspberry Pi in what's known as headless mode, where we can actually unplug it from a monitor and then drive it from our PC over a remote connection. But to do that, we need to know the IP address of our RetroPie system. So if we go to the RetroPie configuration, there's a little option down the bottom which says show IP. So if we go to that, this brings us up a display in the console, and you can see there your IP is 192.168.1.192. And we'll need to make a note of that, as we're going to need to use that when we connect from our PC. So we can exit out of all of that stuff, and then go right back to our main menu page in RetroPie. To connect to the Raspberry Pi over SSH, we need an SSH client. Now these are built into Linux and Mac computers, but if you're running on a Windows PC, you'll need to go into your settings, then go to apps, then go to optional features. Then we want to search for, in, in the search box here, we want to search for open SSH. And we should see Open SSH Client come up. And if you click on that, then you should be able to install that. Obviously, I've, I've already installed this. But install that first, and then we're ready to access the Raspberry Pi. If you're running an older version of Windows, or if you prefer to, you can use a little application called Putty. And this is an SSH client. So if you go to putty.org, and then follow the links to download, so download and install that, and, and when you run it, you will have a little window like this pops up, and then all we need to do for this one is, in this host name or IP address, you'll just type in the IP address of your Raspberry Pi, and then click open, and that will bring you up your SSH terminal window. To use the OpenSSH client on Linux or Mac, just open up one of your terminal windows. Um, on a PC, you'll need to go to your Windows menu, type in CMD, and then click on Command Prompt, and that will open up your terminal. So once you've got your terminal window or Command Prompt, we simply want to use the SSH client and we're going to connect to our Raspberry Pi. So we need to use our username. Um, so the default one on the Raspberry Pi is pi at, and then our IP address that we discovered from the Raspberry Pi. So once we do that and then hit return, we should find that it starts to connect. Um, there'll be certain, you might get some warnings about private keys and so on, but again, we're just all accessing over a local network, so that doesn't matter. We then need to put in the Raspberry Pi um, username password, which of course is Raspberry, and that should then connect us to our Raspberry Pi. 
And there we go, we're now looking at, uh, and this, this terminal prompt we now have is actually on our Raspberry Pi. So any commands we type here will then affect the actual machine itself. So now that we've got the Raspberry Pi set up, we need to connect the LCD screen. So the screen I'm using is just a very basic 3.2 inch LCD panel uh, with a resolution of 320 by 240 pixels. It's based on the ILI 9341 driver chip, which uses an SPI connection to communicate with the computer. So that's just what we need. My screen also has an SPI touchscreen and SD card built into it, um, but I'm not going to use those in this project. If you want to get hold of one of these screens, I'll, I'll put some links in the description below, but most of the generic LCD panels will work. Uh, just make sure you know what driver chip your panel uses, and if possible, the ILI 9341, as that will match up with what we're doing in this project. To connect the LCD screen to my Raspberry Pi, I'm going to use the same connection pins as the WaveShare compatible panel that I used in a previous video, and I'll, and I'll put a link to that up in the top right corner. This will make it easy um, to swap back to the standard driver software if I ever need to. If you want to get hold of these circuit diagrams, make sure you go to the project page in my main website. I'll put links in the description below. Um, there you will be able to view these diagrams, and I'll also list out all the code that we're going to be typing in to get this screen up and running. So I'm just building up the circuit on breadboard uh, and using jumper leads to connect from the Raspberry Pi to the LCD panel. So now that we've got the panel connected, we need to get some driver software. And the project I'm using for driving it is this FBCP ILI 9341. And you'll find the GitHub repository if you visit this web address. Now this driver is the same as we used on the previous video where we were setting up the WaveShare driver. Um, and this uses a mixture of increasing the SPI bus speed so we can actually send the data to our screen faster. And also a smart um, redrawing algorithm which means that we don't always have to send all of the screen across so we can actually reduce the amount of data we have to send per frame. Uh, so that is explained a bit more detail in the previous video and I say I'll leave links for that up in the top right corner. But to install this um, driver software then, if we scroll down here, we will come to the actual um, installation process. So it goes through a number of different um, uh, screens that it's able to run. But basically we need to actually build this software on our Raspberry Pi. So we'll need to install some software to compile. We then need to copy down the um, GitHub uh, repository itself and then build that. And the important bit here is that there are a number of options we have to build it with, and that will tell it how to connect to our particular screen. So we need to work out what those options are. Um, there are a number of pre-made displays, but what we're looking for here is that we're going to simply specify the driver um, chip in our display and then the connections we've made to that. So you can see we have um, here a number of different driver chips. So all of these are different driver chips which the system is able to work with. And of course, we're gonna work with the ILI 9341, um, which was the one that this um, package was originally written for. So one of our first options is to turn the ILI 9341 driver on. Then a bit lower down, we will need to pass in a number of the pin numbers that we've used to connect to our Raspberry Pi. So we can see here we're using the data control, the reset, uh, and we're not gonna be using a backlight one on ours, or a submine anyway. Um, and you specify that, and the number you specify there is this BCM pin number, which is the GPIO pin number, uh, and not the connector pin number. There's a slight difference there, which you have to get um, correct on that. But say, I'll, I'll take you to that in a second when we look at that. So we need to specify a data control pin and a reset pin. Um, it assumes that you are using the standard SPI zero port on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so again, we'll have a look there and we'll see the, the uh, master in slave out, the master out slave in the synchronous the SPI clock. And then it uses the chip enable zero pin as the um, LCD chip select. We will then need to set the display speed on this. 
Uh, and what this does is it uses a divisor, so it takes the base clock frequency of the um, of a chip inside the Raspberry Pi, the BCM chip, and divides that down for you. So we set this option here, which is the bus clock divisor, and as it says, that needs to be an even number. And we're going to have a play around that. So to begin with, um, it, it, as it's, if you read through here, it shows you what sort of things to set on that. But we're going to start off with a slow clock speed, just to make sure that we've got all of our connections correct and that everything's set up. And once we've got that worked out, we can then start to play with that. And as I say, um, we, we did all this in the previous video, so if you, if you need any more help with that, do have a look through there. But let's, get, let's work out what pin numbers and what option numbers we need to set up for this then. So if we have a look at our GPIO connector connections then, we can start to get these settings worked out. So the very first one then is that we need to specify our ILI 9341 driver. We then need to set the pin that we're using for our data control pin, and that is on GPIO 24. And our LCD reset pin then is on GPIO 25. And the final setting then is to set our clock divisor, which sets our SPI bus speed. And we're going to set that to 30 for the first go. So I've connected back up to my Raspberry Pi over the SSH connection. And we're all logged in and ready to go. So we're really just going to work through those commands which we need to set this up. So if I paste that in. So again, the first one we're going to do is to install the CMake app, and that allows us to create make files for compiling. And that's probably already installed on your system, but it doesn't hurt to just try reinstalling it again, and it should then at least um, check it, and if it has a new version, it will install a new version. So we can see that mine is already up to date. Next thing then is we need to download the Git repository. And the best place to do that is in your user's home directory. So if I come in here and I just change directory to tilde, um, if you're not already there, that will take you there. So again, I was already there. Next, we need to download the repository. And we're going to use that, do that using git. And we're going to use the git clone function. Now, all of these commands, obviously, I will put those on my main website page that goes along with this project. So please have a look in the um, description down below and you'll get a link to that page. So we're going to clone that repository down and that will simply copy all of the files we need into a folder um, inside my home directory. So that's all down now. So now we want to change directory into that home directory or into that repository directory. So we just cd into there. We are going to actually compile and build a version of this software specifically for our setup. So we're going to do that inside our own directory. So I'm going to make a directory for my build files. I'm then going to cd into that um, folder. And then I'm going to run my um, CMake application with the options that we've already identified. So let me just copy and paste that in. So there we have our, um, our running our CMake, specifying our IRI 9341 driver, our data control pin, our reset pin, and our clock divisor. At the end of the line, we do need to put a space and then two dots. And that just simply tells it to use the source files from the directory above us. So once we run this command, the CMake utility will make the build files and the make files that we need to do the compilation. So that's our, our build files all written, and we're now ready to, act, to, ready to actually go and do the compilation. So if we do a make minus j, that will use those build files we've just created with the CMake utility, and that will actually do the compilation for us. Right, so that's everything compiled now. If I list out the files in my current directory, you'll see we have various CMake files, but the important one is that one in green, the FBCP ILI 9341. That is our compiled version of the software that's set up now for the settings that we specified. 
Before we can run this driver software, we need to check a few settings on the Raspberry Pi. So the first file we're going to check is our config.txt file. So if I do sudo nano and then slash uh, boot slash config.txt, this file controls a number of the hardware settings and services inside the Raspberry Pi. So if we scroll down here, there's a few things we need to check. Now, if, if you, this is a fairly clean version of RetroPie, so a lot of these um, are just left at the default settings. But if you have been installing some software or some um, LCD screens especially, you might find some of these have been turned on. The first thing to check is this DT param equals SPI equals on. This is a line which turns on the hardware SPI service on the Raspberry Pi. Now, if you've installed any other LCD drivers, you'll find this has been turned on. Odd enough, in this package, although we're using the SPI interface, we actually need the default um, drivers turned off. The package comes with its own set of SPI drivers, and if we leave them both turned on, then obviously the um, default drivers will interfere with the new drivers. So we must comment out that line. You're then looking for, as well in here, you may have a line which looks um, along the lines of something like that, where you have a DT overlay equals some sort of driver that relates to your LCD screen. Now again, we're going to be replacing that. So if you have got something like that in your file, you need to comment it out with a hash. Um, and that then again, make sure that the two don't interfere with each other. Then coming down the file, um, really the rest of it is all okay. Um, the Pi 4 section, that's fine. And then the very last bit's just setting up various GPU memory sizes. So as long as we have got the default SPI driver hardware turned off and any LCD um, DT overlay um, drivers turned off as well, that's all we need out of here. So control X to exit from that and yes to save changes and to rewrite that. The second file we need to check then is our etc um, RC local file. So again, we have to edit that with um, raised privileges, and it's rc.local. And this um, is in effect sort of our startup file for any sort of um, services and so on we need at startup. So again, mine is a clean one and there's nothing in here that we don't need. You might find if you have been installing other drivers um, that you have another version of SBCP um, running on your system. If that's the case, you need to take that line out and then we need to save this file and that won't let it interfere with what we're doing. So once we've edited those two files, um, if you haven't had to change anything, then you don't need to reboot. Um, but if you have needed to change anything, then we need to reboot and come back into our terminal. So we're now ready to run that software. Now, make sure that you are in the FBCP ILI9341 slash build folder, because again, that's where we compiled our new set of driver software. And then I can simply set it running by calling it by name, FBCP ILI9341. So if I run that, that will set the driver running and we should find something come up on our LCD screen. And there we go, we got our um, RetroPie now showing. Now, that obviously is working okay, obviously apart from being upside down. Um, and we're gonna fix that in just a second. But what we can now do is we can now start to play with our settings to get it working just the way we want it. So the first thing I'm gonna do obviously is to flip my screen round by 180 degrees. Um, but this is um, the process we need to go through. Any, any changes we want to make to our settings, and this includes our speed settings, we will need to go through this whole process. So let me just show you that first. So I need to exit out of the driver software by doing Control C. We need to, we're, in, we're currently in our build folder and we need to get rid of that to be able to rebuild it for a new set of settings. So I want to do CD dot dot, which moves me up one folder. I then want to do remove 
and the minus R is a recursive remove, so it'll remove everything inside the folder as well. And we want to remove the build folder. So that's cleared out my last compilation of this software. I now need to rebuild it again. So I'm going to do CD, so I'm going to do uh, make directory again. So I'm going to make that build directory again. I'm going to CD into it. I then go to use my up arrow, which takes me through the last terminal commands that I've been using. And I'm looking for the one where I did the CMake command, which was back here somewhere. Okay, so that's the last set of settings that I used in my CMake command. And for me, I'm just going to put in a new one here, which is going to rotate the display. So I'm just gonna grab hold of that and come across in here and put that in. And again, leave the space between my two dots. So I'm going to recompile my um, driver software. I'm going to keep the same clock divisor just for now until I get this display the right way round. And I've now put in the rotate by 180 degrees. Now this will only rotate my um, LCD um, or the SPI version of my screen. My HDMI version, if I plug into a monitor, will not be rotated. So let's rebuild that. And now that we've got our make files built, we can now make it with a make minus J, and that will do the actual compilation and prepare our new set of driver software. Okay, so we've now got our new version of software compiled. Now let's see if that then flips our screen round. So I'm just using my up arrow to go back through my commands until we get to our driver running um, command, and let's see what that does. And there we have our screen the right way round. Um, so again, you can see there, um, every time we want to change a setting on the way this driver works, we will have to exit out of the driver, remove our build folder, then rebuild the software with our new settings, and then try that out. Before we start messing with the settings, let's just get a feel for where we are at the moment by testing out some gameplay. So I've loaded up a Super Nintendo uh, game here called Aero Fighters, and we'll go in and see what sort of um, performance we get. Now, you might notice that there are a number of numbers at the top of the screen, and these are the statistics from the driver package. And by default, it puts these on screen so we can see what's happening um, as, the, as the game is playing. Now, obviously, once we've finished and got everything fine-tuned, we'll turn those off and we'll then just have the, the normal display. But they're very, very helpful as we're setting up, because as I say, it does actually tell us what frame rates we're getting. So the number we're looking at is um, in the top left corner. At the moment there's a little um, dash there at the moment, but as we start to play the game and the screen starts to change more, as it's just doing now, you'll see some numbers coming up. So the numbers, the first number is the frames per second. So at the moment we're running at between 13 and 14 frames per second. Now, th after that, you might get P and I. Um, if we get P, that means it's a full frame being rendered every time. If we get I, that means it's um, actually using what's known as interlaced mode, where it only renders half of the frame on each frame. Um, but again, it, it does that to speed up the process. Um, you might then get some, as you can see at the moment, some red numbers appearing, uh, and those are frames which have been dropped. In other words, the system decided it just didn't have enough time to draw those frames, so just ignored them, and those would then be skipped frames. But let's let's have a go. But you can see there we're, we're getting a range of values. Um, so at the moment, sort of heading up around the sort of 50 frames per second mark and so on. But let's actually go into the game and see how it compares there. So just going through these start screens. And we'll just use all the, all the standard selections, and here we go. So you can see there we're getting our sort of mid-teens of frames per second as we play the game. And what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and then fine-tune this, obviously, to try and get those values up. So if we look through there... so. We're hitting in that mid-teens, fairly consistently in the mid-teens. And you can see there the actual, some of the other numbers tell you the speed. So you can see there the SPI bus speed at the moment is 13 megahertz. Um, so let's start looking at tuning that in a bit better and get a bit of better performance.
So I'm back out to my SSH terminal. I'm going to do control C to exit out of that. And this is one of the really good things about working um, using the SSH terminal while the game's running on my LCD screen is that I don't actually have to keep resetting the system. I can come in here and tinker with things and then try them out. So we're going to do exactly the same as we did before. We're going to come out of that directory. We're then going to remove our build directory. And then I'm going to rebuild it with some new sets of parameters. And the parameter I'm going to change now is this um, divisor. So on my divisor then, I'm going to come down here. So at the moment we have it set to 30. So the, the default clock speed of our BCM chip is 400 megahertz. So dividing that by 30 gave us the 13 and a third megahertz. Let, let's take that to the extreme and set it to 2. And that will be pretty much then trying to drive our, our SPI bus at 200 megahertz, which should be too fast for it. But let's see what that looks like if we do go this fast. So that's our file recompiled. So if we now uh, run that, and we'll see what performance we're getting. Okay, so that's obviously not working for us. Um, you saw there the screen uh, did a little bit of a, uh, a wobbly and then has gone blank. So we've obviously now running it just that little bit too fast. So let's quit out of that. Um, so really all we have to do now is play with that divisor integer um, until we get it running as fast as possible with a reliably um, intact display. So let me do that and see where I get to. So that's my display tuned in a bit better now. And as you can see from the statistics on screen, so the, the dark blue numbers in the middle of the screen at the top are SPI bus frequency now. I'm using that, if you look at the end, a, a divide by six. So I set my divisor value to six, which gives me the 66.6 .6, um, megahertz SPI bus, which again is, is, is a pretty good speed. And from that, if we start to have a look at some of the gaming displays on this, so let's go into a game here. into the actual gameplay itself. So you can see, we're now getting up in the sort of 40s and 50s frames per second, which, and if you look at this, the actual display itself, you'll see that we're getting really nice, smooth animation on this game. So that becomes a very, very playable system. And if I can just sort of come through here, and you can see there, I don't think, I can't see it, so it's not dropping any frames at the moment. We're getting a really good, nice smooth display, and I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that. Right, so that shows there we can now, by just playing around with it, we can get to a very, very good frame rate. Now, depending on what particular screen display you have, um, you'll, you'll have to play around with that value. So six is a pretty good um, value there. It gets us to say to 67 megahertz on our SPI bus speed. The previous display I was using what was a slightly higher resolution screen, but I could only get that to about 20 megahertz um, bus speed. So again, it, it will depend on your particular make and model of screen. Uh, but again, it, it's just down to playing about and seeing how good you can get it. So there are a few other modifications we now need to make. Obviously, we need to turn off the statistics, but we also have to play a little bit with our HDMI screen display, because at the moment, what's happening is that th this, this driver, it has a look at what's being displayed on the HDMI output. So it, it basically takes a snapshot of that, scales it down to the LCD screen, and then displays that on our LCD panel. So at the moment, mine is probably trying to display a full 1080p HD HDMI display. And of course, that's having to be scaled down. Uh, and you'll particularly notice that whenever we have very small text and so on, it, it tends not to scale that very well. So what we're gonna try and do as well as take the, st the statistics off is rescale our HDMI display to match with our LCD screen. And that should make the whole process a lot easier then for our driver to 
produce the frames that need to be shown on screen. So let's go back into our terminal and see how we do that. So back into our SSH terminal and I've already exited out of the driver. So we want to add one more option. So again, we'll have to go through our, our build process again. Um, so rm minus r, our build directory, make dear build and cd build. So we're back in there again and let's bring back up our make line. So to turn off the statistics display, we have to add one extra little line onto this, um, one option onto our build line. So let me just put that in here. And that is where we say minus D to st st statistics equals zero. So um, that basically says that there are different levels of statistics you can have on here. The default level is level one. Level two starts to draw little graphs on the screen as well. Um, but if we set it to zero, that will turn off the statistics. And you can see there that I have my clock divisor value set to six for this particular setting. So that's what works for me. So we need to, of course, now build it with those settings. So that's rebuilt our new and hopefully final version of our driver software. Now, at the moment, we have been obviously running it from our command line and activating it and then turning it back off again. But when we go to have our actual um, device running on, on RetroPie, we want that all to start up um, when we turn on the computer. So let's add that then into our startup files. So if we do sudo nano and it's our etc rc.local file that we need to edit. So again, as I said, this is the script that sort of runs as your user boots up. And inside here then, we need to put in a piece of code which is going to run that driver software. So, so basically, if we come in here, if I paste that in. So we need to use, so it's exactly the same command that we were using to run it. So we have to use our sudo to uh, give us higher privileges. Um, and then we have to the, specify the exact um, path to that executable file. So it's home, pi, again, I'm running as the default pi user, um, the fbcp ili9341 directory, the build folder, and then the fbcp ili9341 actual software. At the end of that line, we need to put an ampersand, uh, and that then is, is basically the format then for this particular file. So if we save that, so control X, and save those settings, that should now on the next boot up run that driver software automatically. Now I did mention the last thing we need to do is to make sure that our HDMI settings match with our screen display. And that is set in our config.txt file. So sudo nano and that's so that's in the boot folder and it's config.txt. If we scan down the file then, we can go through some of the things that we need to just set up. So the first thing is this disable overscan. So overscan can sometimes introduce uh, black borders around our active um, display area. So if we um, turn that off, so we've disabled the overscan, that should help out. Um, we, we want to make sure that our um, game display fills our LCD screen. We then want to come down to the HDMI force hot plug. Now, because we have not got an HDMI monitor plugged in, the Raspberry Pi will tend to um, not enable the HDMI display. So putting this to HDMI force hot plug equal to one, that makes sure that it uses our HDMI settings, because of course we're gonna try and force it to match our LCD dimensions. So coming down to the bottom of the of the um, listing now. So we have some uh, GPU memory settings. So just leave those in place. We have an overscan scale. Um, if you have that in place, we can take that out because of course we're not using overscan. We then want to actually force the HDMI resolution to match our LCD screen. 
So if I go across to the Raspberry Pi um, documentation, there is a page on the config.txt file, and in that there is a custom mode for the HDMI settings. And we can see here that we have this setting HDMI CVT, and that lets us specify a width, a height, a frame rate, and an aspect ratio, and so on. So uh, we can do that with our LCD screen. So we know that our LCD screen is 320 pixels wide, it's 240 high. We want to run at 60 hertz for our frame rate. Now our, our 320 by 240 is a three to two aspect ratio. Um, that is not one of the set ones in here. So the closest that I can see here is um, aspect ratio five, which is a 16 to 10. So that's pretty close to it. And then the, the margins interlace and reduce blanking, we can just leave those at their default values. Now, if we come down, you'll see the full set of commands we need to issue then. So to be able to use the HDMI CVT command, we need to make sure that we are forcing HDMI group two and HDMI mode 87. And that, and that mode 87, that tells it to use our custom settings. And then the HDMI drive means that it forces it to use the HDMI port. So I'm just gonna simply copy that block there just to make it easy to type it in. And then jumping back to our SSH terminal, if I just come in here, if I right click with my mouse, that does a paste inside the terminal. And then I can just simply edit the numbers that I need. So we're doing 320 pixels by 240, frame rate 60 and aspect ratio five. So that should now allow us to reboot the system and have it match our LCD screen dimensions, and then fill the screen as well. So if I do Control X to X out of that, save that, and there, and then do a sudo reboot now. Let's see what happens. So as our Raspberry Pi boots up, it takes a bit of time before that rc.local file actually gets executed. So you'll find it has a blank screen for a while, while that all gets set up. But once the driver does click in, you'll notice that we now have a much lower resolution screen display. And then as that continues on to boot up into emulation station, we should now see that we have, our smaller text should be slightly clearer than it was before, because of course we're not doing that scaling idea, but our screen is now completely filled by RetroPie. We can then go into a game, and let's just see how that looks on the screen as it plays. So as the game comes up, we can see that we're now using the full LCD area. And as we go into the gameplay itself, we will hopefully see that we continue to have our nice, smooth, high frame rate animations, which makes the game obviously very, very playable. And all of this, of course, with just using a very cheap, generic, sub 10 pound SPI LCD screen. So that does bode well then, um, as, as I obviously continue with this project um, towards making a, a little portable handheld gaming device, um, being able to keep the cost down using these cheap screens makes that a much, much better option. So that's how to set up a high frame rate LCD screen on your Raspberry Pi Zero powered RetroPie system. We've seen that we can get away with using a very cheap generic LCD panel, which works over our serial SPI channel, but still get well above 30 frames per second with nice, smooth, clear animation for our games. So this is really the first step in putting together a portable retro games console. If you've enjoyed this and you'd like to follow along as I put the rest of the console together, make sure you subscribe to my channel and click on the notification bell so you don't miss any of these updates. Also, make sure you check out my main website, and I'll put some links in the description below, and there you'll get the circuit diagrams and code I've used in this video, as well as links to all my other projects that I've been doing. So, that's it for this video. I hope to see you in the next one soon, and bye for now. Don't forget to visit the course pages for this project. There you'll be able to download the code for this lesson and get lots of extra hints and tips. You'll also get access to all my other programming, electronics and gaming projects. All the links are in the description below. For more games programming, electronics projects and retro gaming, 
please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and visit my website.